watercolour water control. That's what we're going to talk about in today's video. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel we do all things watercolour as well as drawing tutorials, little bit of mixed media and motivation for artists. If that's the kind of content you enjoy, please do consider subscribing. It really helps me out and it's completely free. So just before we start today, look at the mess behind me. That's from the uh, the Winter Landscape Challenge. If you don't know about that, I'll link it at the end of this video. I'm thinking of doing a video at Christmas or just before Christmas, going through the process of tidying and organizing my studio because it needs a bit of a cleanup. Let me know in the comments if that's something that would interest you. I personally love looking at how other people organize their stuff. So onto today's subject, we're going to talk about water control. And many of you are focusing, I think, on the wrong thing. So I see so much obsession over how much water to mix with your paint. You know, should it be this consistency or this consistency? It's far more important that you learn to control the paint once it's on the paper and you learn to add and remove water as you need to than it is to obsess over exactly how much water you mix with your paint. And I have seen people take this to such extremes and it's really not necessary. I don't think that much about how much water I mix with my paint, certainly not on a deep scientific level. So in today's video, I'm going to show you how to control the water and the watercolor paint once it's on the paper so that you can get it to do what you want it to do. Now, quick disclaimer, last time I said something about blooms and backruns, cauliflowers, whatever you call them being a mistake, somebody absolutely ranted at me in the comments and went on about how these things can be used positively and directed me to look at someone else's channel so that I could learn how to do this. Thank you so much, I don't have the time. Believe me, this is my job. And when I finish doing it, I'll be watching cooking and sewing videos, maybe a little bit of politics too. So yes, I am completely aware that all of these things that are so-called mistakes can be used positively for good in your paintings and can indeed be very beautiful. If you would look at my own work, you'll see I use them all the time. But that's not the point of this video. And the best way to learn how to make something happen on purpose when you want it to is to learn how to avoid it happening. And so that's what we're looking at in this video. And you don't want to run before you can walk. So if you learn to control the paint and learn to stop it doing certain things, you will inherently have understood then how to do those things on purpose when you need them to be done on purpose. So let's start this video with a quick look at why paint does what it does when you put it on the paper. Now, it's really easy when you're a beginner and all sorts of things go wrong with your paintings for you to feel that watercolour, once you put it down, it can just do anything. It does all of these crazy things. There's no control. You don't know what it's going to do next. It never dries how you expect it to dry. But really, there's only one thing that watercolour does. And once you understand this one thing, you can then take that knowledge out from there and control everything else. So the one thing that watercolour does is that wet paint will run to an area that's less wet. So here's some paint and it's starting to dry. Now I've got some purple paint here. If I place that purple paint on dry paper or dry paint, completely dry paint, it won't go anywhere. It'll just sit where I put it. However, if I place it next to a damp area like this, it's going to start to bleed across. It's basic physics, so the paint wants to spread, it wants to seek a level, the water in the paint wants to seek a level. And this area is less wet, so some of this paint is gonna head over there. You see this side here where it's dry, it's not going anywhere at all. If you understand this basic principle, you'll then understand why watercolor paint does what it does. We're going to explore it more during the course of this video. Next up, we're going to look at puddles and why they are usually the enemy. So this paint here is still damp. I'm gonna drop some paint in the middle, make a nice sort of uh, back run or bloom or cauliflower, whatever you might like to call that. It's very pretty, isn't it? What does this look like in the middle? It looks like a puddle, doesn't it? We've got a puddle going on here. And here's the second thing to understand is that puddles are often the enemy, unless you're doing something like this on purpose. Basically, a puddle of paint will dry slower than the rest of the paint. So if you put down paint and there are puddles within that paint, those puddles are going to dry more slowly than the other paint, which means that this thinner paint will start to dry first. This paint will then be wetter in the puddle and the puddle will drift outwards. So puddles produce uneven drying times. 
and uneven drying times produce blooms, cauliflowers, back runs, and things that you may not initially, when you start painting, be able to control. So now we're gonna look at a couple of things you can do to improve water control with your paper before you even go near a paintbrush. And the first one of those, I know some of you don't want to hear it, but hear me out, the first one of those is to stretch your paper. Here is a board of stretched paper. Let me move it so you can see the edge. You see the tape there holding it down. It's been stretched in this position. Now people will tell you that paper stretching is difficult and fiddly and time consuming and not worth the bother. All of those things are not true. There are some very long winded methods on the internet. I've also seen ridiculously long videos showing you how to try and flatten your paper after it's dried, bumpy and wobbly when it would have been so much faster to uh, stretch your paper in the first place. Let's look at a painting that I did last week and this was part of my winter landscape challenge and this was the Aurora Borealis. But I want you to look at the edges here, particularly this side. You can see where I swept the paint across. I was really being vigorous with the paint and controlling the paint. I would not have been able to control the paint and smooth it out as well as that if I had had to stop right at the edge of a board would have been almost impossible and if I did manage to do it all the paint would be dripping down the side of the board. Stretch paper will still go a little bit bumpy while you're working on it but it'll be much reduced and it'll always dry completely flat. We learned in the last tip that puddles lead to uneven drying times. What does bumpy paper lead to? It leads to puddles. Now there are many other advantages to stretching your paper. This video is not long enough for me to explain how to do it, but luckily I already did that. You'll find a video link in the description of this video that's going to give you my quick and easy paper stretching method. Don't be scared of it, it's incredibly fast and easy and it does actually save you some money. will also allow you to get a better result if your paper is a little bit on the cheaper side or if you're wanting to start learning to paint using a practice paper, paper stretching is going to make all the difference. Next up, I want you to stop using hot press paper. Now beginners often think because of its smooth surface that it must be easier to get the paint to do what you want it to do and to have more accuracy, but that's not the point of hot press paper. I'm gonna show you why you usually want to avoid it by using some stuff from my kitchen. So paper comes in different surface types and within each manufacturer, there'll be a variation. In other words, one person's smooth paper may look like another manufacturer's rough paper. But generally speaking, you've got rough, which as the name suggests is a rough surface. You've got a medium surface, which is called cold pressed or not, by which I mean it's called not, not that it's not. Anyway, you know what I mean. And then you've got hot press, which is much smoother. I'm not actually certain this is a hot press paper. I think this may just be a very smooth medium surface, but you can see the difference. This thinner piece here has got a lot more texture. So why am I telling you not to use hot press paper if the aim is to smooth your paint and get it nice and even? Let me show you. So I've got a couple of uh, items from my kitchen here. And the reason I've picked these up is just to show you what happens when you put paint onto a smooth surface and onto a textured surface. Now, both of these items are plastic. They are not absorbent. So I think I'll actually use some red paint so you can see it properly on camera. So I'm gonna put some red paint on this smooth surface here. Now look at that, the surface tension is holding it in place and it's forming these great big puddles. Let's look at what happens when I paint on this chopping board that not only has a textured surface but has also been cut many times. Look at that. Do you see how the paint is spreading out much more evenly? I'll have to give this a good disinfect now. The bumps in your paper are not just for show. They're there to help you to spread the paint evenly and to keep the water and the pigment from beading up. Painting on a smooth or hot press paper will always encourage the paint to puddle and the drying times to be uneven. It's not impossible to work on, but I would only choose it for very specific reasons. Now, when would I choose hot press paper? only really when working in mixed media. For example, if I wanted to do a painting in watercolor, and then I wanted to apply something on top, something that was much more suited to a smooth surface, that might be collage that I needed to dry nice and flat, or it could be a dry medium like charcoal or colored pencils that really this paper is far too rough for, then I might choose a hot press paper. But for ordinary watercolor painting, 
I'll avoid it whenever possible. And believe me, you can still get incredibly fine details even on a textured surface paper. You're making your life so much harder if you choose hot press. My next tip is to use the largest brush that you can for any given area. And I'm going to explain why that is. People are often quite confused about which size brush to choose, but I follow a simple rule. I choose the biggest one that I can manage to wield within that particular part of the painting. That might be very large, or it might have to be smaller, or it might be very tiny indeed. Last week, very unusually for me, I was using this brush here because I was painting tiny, tiny little tree branches. I sometimes use a brush like this. Very good if I've got small leaves or petals to paint. I may choose a bigger brush like this or an even larger one than the ones I've shown you so far, or perhaps even a large flat brush, but I'm going to choose the biggest brush that I can manage for any part of my painting, and that's because I want to paint quickly. So I want to be able to start up here with a brush that holds lots of water and come all the way down, spreading the paint quickly and evenly so that one part doesn't have time to dry when I'm playing with another part and we don't get those uneven drying times and uneven water levels. Now, if I choose to use a brush that's much smaller, it doesn't hold as much paint. You see how quickly the paint runs out. So now I've got to keep working at it and I've got to keep dipping in to the water jar and I've got to keep spreading and applying that paint and stop starting. And you see already there's a danger that some parts are drier than other parts. And already we're in danger of getting more of an uneven result uneven water levels and uneven application. So a simple rule is use the biggest brush that you can manage. Now we've talked about using a large brush so that you can work quickly. And that is one of the biggest tips that I have for you when doing your watercolor painting. And that is to plan slowly and work quickly. So what do I mean by this? I used to teach real life classes. I did so for decades in fact, and walking around the classroom so often I'd see people almost sabotaged by their lack of planning. So what would happen is I see a student sort of wet the paper and then they were like, oh, I can't find that color now. I thought it was in my bag, but it's not there. Or a lid got stuck on. I was about to put this color on, but the lids got stuck on. Or I've just squeezed it out and I hadn't used it for 10 years. A load of gum Arabic came out of it. I need to sort that out. Now I'm in a mess. The clock's ticking, the paper's drying. So you want to avoid all of that happening, by which I mean you need to look at each part of your painting. Say you're starting with the sky and you normally would in a landscape start with the sky. I want you to have everything ready. Now there are certain interruptions that we can't foresee. Amazon delivery drivers, cats biting feet. But other than that, you should give yourself the best possible chance that you can apply the paint quickly and have everything you need. So make sure you've got the brush you need, make sure the paint is ready and set out. Check that you can get the lids off. In fact, squeeze the paint out first or have the pan paints ready, make sure it's clean. Make sure you have absolutely everything you need and always a cloth or some paper towel on hand. Make sure you have a good idea of what you're going to do and that you have practiced it if this is perhaps a new technique. I know it sounds extreme, but I have sometimes spent 20 minutes planning a sky and 30 seconds applying it. My next tip, and hopefully I've got some B-roll that I can drop in here because I know I was doing this recently when I was doing the winter landscape challenge and I was doing those big skies. My next tip is to wipe the edges of your board. And this is another advantage of stretched paper. But even if you use something like masking tape, if you've applied something with a lot of wet paint, like a sky, for example, you need to wipe around the edge of the board before it dries. And that's because paint tends to sit at the edges. It will seep under the tape. Perhaps you're using a block and the paper has become slightly curved. And the paint's kind of sitting at the edges. You won't notice it, but later on, that wet area will come back in, just as we discussed at the beginning of the video, and bleed into the damp paint that's drying. And it's drying faster because there wasn't a puddle there. Believe me, this is one technique I don't see talked about very often, but it's really important. It doesn't even matter if you take off, you know, a millimeter, a tiny fraction of paint around the edge of your board. If you were ever to put that painting in a frame, that wouldn't show anyway. And actually the paint normally spreads back to cover that little bit. So don't worry about that. I want you to wipe around the edge of your paper, of your board, after applying something like a sky or any large wet area that goes to the edge of the paper. It's going to stop those sneaky little puddles of paint that you didn't even notice coming back later on to ruin your work. 
My next tip is, have you heard the saying, perfect is the enemy of good? So that's my next tip. How many paintings have you ruined by sort of just thinking, oh, I'll just touch that little bit up there and it's ended up making things worse. I'm gonna give you a little demonstration and show you why, just as in relationships, you should never really go back. Now, even if I'm using a large brush and I'm applying this nice smooth paint, this is some Daniel Smith green gold, isn't it a beautiful color? And I'm applying the paint evenly. What I don't want to do is go back into an area that may already be drying. So a big mistake people make is they see a mistake somewhere and they want to smooth that area out or make it a little darker. I'm going to go back with a different color. Of course, you'd usually be using the same color. I'm just going to use a different color so you can see what happens. So we'll dip in and we'll get some more of our supposedly green paint and we'll just go back. I'll just, there's a, there's a, see these little dots here? I don't like those. Let's see if we can smooth those out. So what have we done now? We've created puddles we've created wet paint on top of damp paint, and now we're going to get marks and drying lines. So now we're in a panic and we're gonna try and spread that paint out, and we're probably just going to make it worse. Those tiny imperfections would not have even shown. And even if I did find that after it dried, I didn't like them, it'd be much better to let that first layer of green dry and then put another wash across the top, smoothing out any imperfections. Never get across to one side of an area or across one side of a sky and then go back in with a damp brush to try and fix something that's so microscopic nobody would have noticed it in the first place. My next tip is to let things dry, to let your painting get completely bone dry at regular intervals. And you probably know when those times occur. I so often see beginners, they're like a teenager with a sports car. They're going to drive it as fast as they can until they crash it into a wall. Don't crash your painting into a wall. You need to let things dry. It's very deceptive when you see tutorials, even tutorials such as mine, and the artist says, let this dry, and you don't see how long they're letting it dry for. I'm not gonna leave my camera running for two hours while I go and have a cup of tea, feed the cat, do a bit of vining pop over to the shop for some more bread and come back again and switch the camera on. It just is a millisecond to you because it's just a cut in the video. But all professional artists leave their painting to dry regularly and often. The only time you may not have to do this would be something like if you're doing something botanical, say you're painting something with lots of small flowers and leaves and you've got just a white paper background, it's possible then you may be able to just keep moving around your board and never needing to stop to let areas dry because you are letting areas dry but you're just moving between places on the board. But other than that, if we're talking about landscapes, animals, portraits, whatever it is, there's going to come a time when you need to let it dry. And it's just good to take a break anyway. It's going to give you a bit of perspective on what you're doing and what it needs next. How long to leave it to dry, that's something I can't tell you because it all depends on where you're living, the heat, the humidity. It may be 10 minutes, it may be a couple of hours, it could even be, and this is something I do if I really need to make sure that my work is absolutely bone dry, I'm leaving it overnight. The next thing which may sound counterintuitive is to let your mistakes dry before fixing them. There's only one thing that you should do the second you make a mistake. I'm gonna show you exactly what that is next. And then you need to let your work dry. Mistakes fix so much more easily after they're dry. Let me explain why. Oh no, I made a mistake. I dripped some paint. What am I going to do? There's only one thing I'm going to do to this. I'm going to grab a rag or some paper towel and I am going to blot it once, lift. Now I'm going to leave it alone and let it dry. It may seem counterintuitive, especially if you're used to, you know, if you've spilt some red wine on the carpet, the quicker you get to that, the better, right? But it's not the same with painting. When the paper surface is damp like this, it's fragile. So the chances are that any attempts to scrub this out are actually going to either damage the surface of your paper or they're going to push the pigment further in. What you want is for it to completely dry out so the pigment is sat on top of the paper and the water has evaporated. So now you're saying to me, well, fair enough, Michelle, but how do I fix it? Now, there are multiple, multiple ways of fixing mistakes. Too many to go through in this video. I have a separate video that will show you how to fix, I think it's 10 different watercolor mistakes. Everything from smoothing out skies to lifting paint off paper to covering it up. I'll link that video in the description of this video. It's gonna show you how to take mistakes out. But the one thing I don't want you to do is to fuss around with the mistakes when they first happen. There's only one thing to do, 
blot it, leave it alone, let it dry, and then you can decide where to go from there, whether that's overpainting, smoothing, scrubbing out, or something else. Let's now look at some methods for controlling the paint with the brush and controlling water levels with the brush once it's on the paper. And for this next technique, you're going to learn how to use your brush like a vacuum. Far more important than worrying about how much water to put with your paint is understanding how to control the water once it's on the paper. Now this is too wet, this won't dry evenly because even stretched paper will lift and curve a little bit which means the puddling will end up over one side and one side will dry, it looks like it's going to be this side, one side will dry more quickly, a puddle will sit on the side and it will come in. So we need this paint to be even without puddles. So what do we do? We're going to to rinse and dry my brush. I'm not taking all of the liquid out of it, just drying it a little bit. It will now act as a vacuum and lift paint out. Now there's two ways you can lift paint out. You can do it without it showing like this, making tiny dabs, but you see they pretty soon disappear. And I'm just, when I need to, dry or I can clean and dry my brush and just going to make little dots and lift the excess water out to give it much more chance of drying evenly. Don't work on this for too long. But there's a second way of lifting out that we can do actually as a technique. This is going to give us a soft highlight, particularly good for things like leaves. So I've applied my paint here. I'm going to do exactly the same with my brush. I'm going to rinse, get it semi-dry, but this time I'm going to press harder and actually lift paint out. I may need to do this a few times if the area is quite wet and I've lifted out there a nice soft highlight. So on the first section of paint I just did tiny tiny dots with the tip of my brush and I evened out the water level so it will dry evenly without any cauliflowers or blooms. But the second one I pressed more firmly and lifted out a visible highlight. It's a really useful technique. You should be using your brush to control the water levels. And of course, this is going to work better with a larger brush. Have you ever tried to add another color to an area of damp paint and it's all gone wrong? So we learned about what happens when you put wet paint into damp. Let's look now at adding damp paint into wet. This is going to allow you to add extra color or an extra dark area to an already damp area without everything going wrong. Now we saw what happened when we had paint that had started to dry and we put another colour in with wet paint and we got one of those very pretty blooms, didn't we, all spread out. What if I want to put a second colour on here, but I don't want it going anywhere and I don't want that bloom effect. What I'm going to do is use thicker paint than the surface it's going onto. So this is going to mean trying to pick up quite sticky paint. You can do it straight from a tube or you can use pan paints. If the paint's too wet, you could consider just pressing this on your paper towel or rag to remove some of the water. What I can do then is I can go into this area. I can make all sorts of shapes. The paint has a soft edge, but it is staying exactly where I put it and we're not getting any bleeds or back runs or drying lines or anything unusual going on. And that's because the paint I went on second with was thicker and drier than the first layer of paint. Therefore, it did not feel the need to spread outwards. And that's the secret to going in with a second color and not getting any drying lines. Of course, as we spoke about at the beginning of the video, you can now, you've learned how it works, manipulate this by going in with wet paint when you want the opposite effect and you want things to spread out. So let me know in the comments if any of these techniques has resonated with you and made a difference to what you're going to do in the future. Now, one of the easiest ways to actually understand these techniques is to watch someone else do them. If you're a member of my Facebook group or perhaps here on YouTube, you saw that recently I had a winter landscape challenge. I've left that up permanently. You can do it at any time. Yes, even if it's the summer where you are. Basically, it's five wintry paintings completely free and you're going to follow along with me as I demonstrate each and every stage. You also get a downloadable PDF with the photograph in and the materials list and everything else. The whole thing is completely free, including the PDFs. I've put all of the videos in a playlist here on YouTube. Find the link in the description or click one of the videos up here.